kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Hello there, welcome to this round table that is focused on scaling action on achieving racial justice. It is part of this year's Sustainable Development Impact Summit. I'm Celeste Headley, a uh, journalist and author, and we have an incredible discussion set for you today. This first part uh, is going to include four discussion leaders, and but the whole entire round table is focused on three questions that I wanted to give to you to make sure that we're all sort of narrowing in on the same issues. How can we align on strategic priorities and invent interventions to build racially just economic systems? Identifying policies for measurement, transparency, and accountability standards around racial equity, and talking about models of public and private collaborations that can accelerate progress toward racial justice. We have an incredible group of speakers today. First up, we have uh, Winnie Benyaima, who is Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of UNAIDS. Also with us, Porter Braswell is Chief Executive Officer of the diversity hiring platform Jopwell. Louise Pentland is the Executive Vice President and Chief Business Affairs and Legal Officer at PayPal. And Manny Masita is part of the International Business Council and CEO of Bain and Company. I do want to let everyone know that uh, this is an interactive section uh, roundtable. During the second half, we will open up for discussion with broader participation among everyone, and three fire starters will lead some separate discussion groups. And we are taking your questions. The Q&A window is disabled in Zoom, but we're using Slido, and you can submit your questions there. So let's get started. And Wendy, I'd love to begin with you. Um, and talk about access to products and services, which is a significant part of equity in the marketplace. And I wonder if you could give us guidance on how private and public sector organizations can work together to make sure that all communities, including underrepresented communities, have access to resources. Thank you, Celeste. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. And I'm delighted to join you, Porter, Louise, and Manny on this very important topic that I feel so strongly about. I also congratulate World Economic Forum for their partnering for racial justice in business. Allow me to share some figures first. 
Black gay men in the United States have a one in two risk of contracting HIV across their lifetime, one in two. This is a higher lifetime risk than the average in my low income country of Uganda, where I come from. And it's almost as high as the risk in very hot spot regions such as South Africa and Zimbabwe. In the United States, a black child is twice as likely to die in their first year than a white child. In fact, black children in the US are more likely to die before their first birthday than guess what? Children in war-torn Libya. In the richest country in the world, the black child is more likely to die before his first birthday than a child born in war-torn Libya. These are just some of the appalling numbers that tell the story of systemic racism. And that keeps me awake at night. In June last year, just after the brutal killing of George Floyd, I joined senior officials of African descent at the United Nations to make a statement, a public statement. We expressed our outrage at, at pervasive and systemic racism all over the world. We highlighted the need to go beyond condemnation and to actively, deliberately end racism in our institutions. That starts with all of us standing up and speaking against racism. We couldn't keep silent as UN officials. We spoke of African descent. And I was asked to chair, to co-chair the United Nations Senior Africans Group, which I'm honored to lead. So ending systemic racism against people of African descent and other races within and outside of the United Nations is one of my key objectives. Now, we had to start by acknowledging that the United Nations itself is not immune to racism, even though we are custodians of anti-racism and all the values of the UN. But we had to admit that it exists. And that recognition is indeed the starting point for action. Then to examine how the system supports racism is our next step to do a thorough analysis of how the system enables, supports, even creates opportunities for racist behavior. UN was created many years ago before many countries had even been created. When it was created, I was myself a British subject. I'm not born yet, but when I was born, I was born a British subject. My country became independent and part of the UN when I was already three years old. So many of its practices and its structures reflect this reality of many people being colonized people, enslaved people when the UN was created. You see that in the composition of the Security Council, who has a voice there permanently, who has a voice sometimes. You see that in the official languages of the UN, in the location of its headquarters, and the approaches to leadership and to hiring and all that. So we need a better balance between nations within the United Nations, and this is part of the reform that many people seek. We must make the existing systems more equitable for the people who work within themselves. For example, how we hire, how we promote, how we, the culture we build in the organization must reflect our, all our diverse histories. And we must dissect it to understand who does it make comfortable, who does it give opportunity, and who does it exclude. At the UN AIDS, which I lead, 70% of my staff working, work in countries and regions. Only 30% work at the headquarters where I am in Geneva, and that's already too many. Our staff come from 122 countries of the UN. 
of the world member state. But, but 40% of the international professional staff, that's the leadership really, are from a handful of countries in Western Europe and North America. So while we are all there from 122 countries, really the leaders are coming from a small number of countries, Western Europe and North America. That has to change. It can only change by looking at the systems, the rules, the practices, and deliberately opening room for excluded groups to be part of it. And that's part of what we are trying to, to encourage within the UN. The Secretary General is leading a uh, very important policy, anti-racism policy, and we, as an informal group are there to support it, to guide it, to, to challenge it, so that we come towards a United Nations that walks its talk on racism. That's what I can say just now. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna move on to Porter Braswell and get everyone's voice in here, especially in terms of our, our if the key action strategies, like specific things that organizations can do to make some to move the needle. And Porter, your area of, of expertise is in recruitment and and hiring and, and not only that, but pathways to success. I wonder what what changes does an organization need to do? So many organizations talk about really valuing diverse uh, teams, and yet they then have trouble carrying that out. Yeah, so there's a lot there's a lot here um the way in which i like to try to break it down is that it's both an internal and then an external strategy but really beginning internally and i think a lot of times while companies want to engage in this conversation of diversity they forget step one which is defining diversity like what does diversity mean for your organization and then when you're talking about underrepresented groups being specific and being able to name what those groups are and then why are we focusing on those groups? And that has to start at the CEO level, the board level, that has to be a top-down dialogue. And it's easier to talk about, we have a diversity challenge rather than being incredibly, incredibly specific about what the actual pain points are. So I would say the first thing is being able to be confident enough to define what diversity means for your organization, the why behind it, and what are the actual underrepresented groups you're gonna be focusing on. The second thing, once you've been able to define it, is that you then start the dialogues. You then start to welcome in the conversations in the corporate setting that historically have been a little bit awkward to necessarily step into. But the, country, the, the world that we live in now, especially in a virtual world, it's impossible to expect your employees to literally look at a TV screen and see what's playing out and then to turn back to this screen and not feel like they can talk about the topics that they're seeing on that screen. So you have to create dialogues within the corporate setting, but it's incumbent on the companies to create the space to allow those conversations to flourish. Then once you start to have those dialogues, you get into strategies. So based on those conversations and the learnings and hearing from your colleagues about their experiences and context, what strategies are we gonna put in place so that we really start to level the playing field and see the outcomes that we're looking, that we're ultimately looking to get to, which then generally leads to programs. So how do you put programs in place that enable different communities, underrepresented communities, start to get their seat at the table and actually find success when it comes to promotion, pay equity, uh, hiring, hiring opportunities. And then once you get into the programs, lastly, you can get into the actual hiring. And so when you have the programs and strategies in place, your organization is feeling confident having these dialogues, you've clearly defined what diversity means. When you actually hire people, they'll stay because you've done the internal work. So this has to be thought of as a holistic strategy. And throughout that entire process, you have to measure it and you have to be transparent about it. So those are some of the things that I've noticed. Measurable goals and transparency is something that we will talk about more. Um, Louise, let's bring you into this discussion because obviously as we move towards racial progress, the idea of, of at least narrowing that racial wealth gap is I'm sure something that's on your mind. And I wonder what role uh, businesses can play in underserved communities that can that can really move the needle. Again, a lot of these topics are things that we've been talking about for decades. So what are the strategies that we know actually work here? Yeah, the great question, Celeste. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. 
I think the first thing you have to do, I, I, and I think all corporations have to do, is they have to level set on a couple of items. One is, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Um, we have to understand what is important, what fits the ethos of a company, its mission. Because I think part of the, the challenge is, um, you know, latching onto something that is sort of, you know, in the moment isn't always going to equal sustainable um, solutions. And so I think having a, a real understanding of what, what works within your organization. And then I think be very intentional about the need. And what I mean by that, and maybe I can give um, an example here um, about one of what PayPal has done. Um, you know, you know, after the the, the George Floyd murder, um, you know, we really did look at uh, and reflect on what our social justice support was, and we we do a lot as a, a, a you know supporting underrepresented communities in general. But here's where we, we took the opportunity to really lean in. Um, and we announced a fund of $535 million to, to support social justice. And the premise of this was to really address the, uh, the economic underpinnings, the wealth gap, uh, the racial tensions, inequality. Um, and there is a lot of need. Um, and instead of immediately just rushing to sort of distribute the funds, we really took the time to listen. We listened to where the need was. And, you know, and I think a big part of what we want to try and accomplish is, um, you know, how do we how do we not just give money and then uh, and try and solve a singular issue? How do we actually support and sustain? So we had different components of that fund. Um, part of that fund was actually giving grants to uh, underrepresented communities. We worked with leaders in those communities, with nonprofits, with NGOs, and we figured out where that need was, was required. And, and we don't just give the money, we also give support. So we give mentoring support to entrepreneurs, um, to, to business owners who need that sort of additional um, sort of long-term sort of support that will, will allow them to give back into their community. So it does become a self fulfilling um, moment, I think, when you can start to get that at scale. Um, but it, we didn't rush into it. We really listened to the need. Um, and, and another big part of our fund that we created was actually, you know, it's one of those sort of, you know, issues where people sort of corporations can say, well, we have rules on what we can invest in, what, what we can't invest in. And a lot of the times, um, you know, the, the Black communities um, of banks, of, of, um, of, of, you know, private equity funds just haven't been given the same access to capital. And I think that's an area where corporations can really lean in because there are a, a lot of organizations um, and we've been able to, to distribute most of our fund um, through some of those mechanisms. Um, these are important issues that hopefully we can talk a little about a little bit more, but I, I want to go to Manny and ask you about integration because it. In the recent years, we have discovered that part of the problem for organizations is that diversity, equity and conclusion have been their own department. Um, and there's those values um, from DEI departments are not always integrated into the actual processes and systems of each organization. How do we integrate these um systems that bring about more racial justice more racial equity how do we integrate them into all parts of a business i think you're muted thank uh thank you thank you, you thank you celeste and uh, um privileged to be on this panel with uh, with winnie and porter and louise um I'll come back to the a broader question of integration, but maybe just contextualize that by building on comments that everybody said um, that um, you know the issue of racial justice for all of us global organizations, we recognize that's an inherently uh, it's global, but it's also a very national and regional issue. And so uh, we have to work this topic somewhat differently country by country. Uh, racial justice and equity in the United States is a different issue from St. Japan or the Philippines, where I'm originally from. Um, I would say that uh, with the comments both uh, Porter and Winnie made that uh, you start by role modeling what we do in our organizations, uh, which includes 
uh, measurement, which is a part of a holistic integration. Um, I'm one of the um, I'm international business council members. You know, we have all signed up for 22 sustainable development goals that we publish. Um, uh, like many companies, PayPal and us included, we are now publishing our this year for the first time, our diversity performance, so that if it's measurable, you can integrate it. If you join the business roundtable, as we're members of, you have to publish your DI metrics. So there's a set of things we do internally, building on Porter's issue, you measure it, it's holistic. And ultimately, we're trying to recruit, retain, develop, um, and, and build uh, underserved uh, communities. And the issues are very different. You take any given country, we can double click on black issues in the United States and Hispanic issues. Um, Asian American issues uh, received a lot of hate uh, in the last uh, year in, uh, in, uh, in COVID times. And, uh, and then the second is um, what you can do externally, uh, either by uh, donating your goods and services um, as uh, PayPal's doing, you know, or, or in our case, finding organizations that can address systemic issues where we provide our services to, um, such as we did last year uh, by uh, supporting the launch of an organization called 110, a group of uh, uh, companies uh, uh, committed to hiring um, blacks without college degrees. It goes back to Winnie's comment, you know, the average white family in the US makes eight times the average black family. And 80% um, of sustaining jobs in the United States require four year college degrees, well, three fourths black Americans don't have them. So um, I, I raise all of that in that in order to um, integrate all of this into the agenda of the corporation, uh, so one example, um, it has to be built into the purpose, mission, and strategy of the company. It has to be an initiative that um, flows through uh, your products, your customers. So as we do that, you know, as, a, as an example, as a services consulting firm, to actually help our client become more diverse, would we have said that was part of a customer value proposition many years ago? Probably not, it is today. You, and then you fold it in into all of your operations. And if it's measured, it's built into your incentives. It becomes a holistic part of your strategy. And for corporations to do that, historically, it's the uh, classic redefinition of what is the purpose and mission of a corporation. You know, we, uh, we have this overuse sometimes term, term now called stakeholder capitalism. Yeah. Well, if uh, we think about uh, the mission is not to maximize your share price but to make a difference with your customers, with your employees, with your communities, with your impact on the world. You make that part of your commitment, you make that part of your measurement and you publicize it. And um, that's, that's how you can make progress. Um, but it's, uh, it's a many problems and will take a concerted action by organizations of all sorts uh, represented on this, uh, on this forum. So we have less than 10 minutes left in this section of our roundtable, and I want to try to drill down on some specific items here. Uh, Louise, let's talk about uh, coming, recovering from the past year and a half, which have been very difficult for a number of organizations. And we have seen over and over again that oftentimes when businesses or organizations are trying to recover from crisis, many of these issues of racial justice and equity get kind of shunted to the side. They're in crisis mode, and so they focus on other things. How can organizations not do that? How can they recover from a crisis and at the same time keep these values front and center? Yeah, look, I, I think actually it's a little bit what, what Manu was saying. I think it really is a redefinition of company mission. Um, and I think, you know, there's sort of two components to that in my mind. One is what is the company doing and how is it operating in the community? And the second piece is how are you taking care of your employees? Because actually, if you take care of your employees um, and, and, really, and really lean in to support their needs, and then those needs are very diverse, um, then they can actually lean back into the community. And I think what we found at PayPal is actually um, our, because we we put our employees first um, and we've made sure that they they have a you know a healthy living wage, 
um, uh, then they can give back to their communities at, at, at scale, actually. And so then when we're driving initiatives to actually make um, you know, the, the, the company services and goods support that community and not leave them behind, then we, you know, really it does come very much from the, the, the employees in the communities they live in. And so I think it becomes somewhat self-fulfilling if, if you can drive it in a very intentional way. Um, but I think, you know, it's easy to sort of create excuses as to why, you know, you know, you know, we, we've got to focus on this first and not that. Um, but actually what we found is it's been incredibly rewarding for both our employees, but also we're seeing the results of some of the um, early funds that we've, we've given to some of the, 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 the racially, um, uh, I think, uh, divided places where we've been able to support. Um, and we're actually seeing pretty incredible results as, you know, that where, where they're able to now help other organizations within their own communities. So it does, it does sort of go to the, the old adage, you know, you know, a high tide lifts everybody's boats. And I think that's what's needed here. So, uh, Winnie, another issue, and, and you referred to this, is the fact that this pandemic has really exposed and highlighted a lot of the racial disparities when it comes to healthcare and how uh, healthy communities are to handle crisis. Um, and I wonder, Winnie, what specific things do you think are preventing healthcare systems from becoming more racially equitable? I, I realize that those are complicated systems, but what, what are the, some of the things that you can point to and say, this is, a, this is an area that we could improve that might, that might make healthcare um, and access to medicine, et cetera, more equitable? The most important challenge today is to achieve COVID vaccine equity. That's really the starting point. Today, it, it is shameful. It is immoral, does not make economic sense, and it is even racist that there is a part of the world where doctors, nurses are dying every day because there are no vaccines, and that in some parts of the world, they are talking about a third booster for the, just in case, because there's not even any evidence that it's needed, but just in case. So this vaccine inequity points to something that is to a, a number of underlying inequalities and injustices, one of them is racial injustice. If perhaps the people who are lacking vaccines were the same race as those who have it now, maybe would be in a different place. So I think we need to look at inequalities and how they intersect to put some people at the bottom and address them very directly, including racial injustice. Health systems are part of globe of uh, national systems. They carry injustices like the data I've just shown you, I've just shared with you about black people in the United States in this great country. Yeah. The health system in their locations where they live, the way they live their lives, the social determinants of health put them at higher risk than other people. That's why we saw the higher deaths of people who work on the front lines, bus drivers, uh, tellers in, in rest, waitresses, people working in, in the supermarkets, those people in those jobs were at more risk for many reasons, including how they live lives in poorer contexts in more deprived contexts, and we are also at risk by being on the front line of the health system. We need to look at those inequalities within the health system and around the health system and address them frontally. And uh, I, I think COVID just exposed an ugly picture in every country. Sorry to keep using the United States as the example. I use it because the richest country. <laughs> But it exposed that ugly picture in every country where systems, whether of health, of education, of social protection, work for some and don't work for others. And, and we must do this analysis. We must talk about it. The dialogues are important. The honest dialogues about where the problem is and, and of course, the measuring it and 
getting results on it. But let's not forget, we must not projectize fighting racism or fighting any injustice. A project is important to have, results to be measured, but the political edge must stay there. You must yeah. have champions who champion politically for an answer. That yeah. We need that balance. Thank you. Thank you. We have come to the end of this first part of this roundtable discussion. So I want to say thank you to our uh, panelists so far. You just heard from Winnie Bin Yaima, Undersecretary General of the United Nations, Executive Director of UNAIDS. Porter Braswell is Chief Executive Officer of the Diversity Hiring Platform, Jopwell. Louise Pentland is Executive Vice President and Chief Business Affairs and Legal Officer at PayPal. And Manny Masita is part of the International Business Council and CEO of Bain and Company. We are not done with this discussion. In just about a minute or so, we will break out into sessions that'll become more interactive. But in the meantime, I wanted to say thank you to all four of our panelists. Thank you so much for participating.